Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Symposium 3. My name is Hee Kyung Jang from Gyeonggi University, and I'm chair of this session with Professor Jung Min So from Songgyungan University. This session title is Pediatric Surgery Session. The title of this session is Minimally Invasive Surgery of the Diaphragm. I hope we have four speakers today, and I hope um, many hot discussion in this program about the surgical techniques and details of minimal invasive surgery or pediatric diaphragmatic surgery. We would like to explain the session program. After each, speak, uh, each speaker's video stream, we will have a Q&A time with the speakers. If you have any questions about the presentation, please click the chat on the right side of the video screen and write down your question. If your question is not picked, you can earn Congress points. I would like to introduce the first speaker. The first speaker is Jungman Nam Gong from Asan Medical University, University of Ulsan, Medical, Ulsan College of Medicine. And he will give a lecture on Bogdalek hernia. Please give the uh, speaker's presentation. I'm Nam Gong from South Korea, working at Asan Medical Center. Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, it's very honor for me to talk this presentation to great audiences and respectful moderator. I'm sorry to present this at Zoom conference due to COVID-19. Uh, I, I hope that uh, social conditions will improve as soon as possible and reach at the conference hall. My presentation is about minimally invasive surgery for CDH, especially Bukhtalek hernia. As my colleagues of the Korean Association know well, in 2015, our Korean Association of Pediatric Surgery performed a national survey about CDH. From 2010 to 2015, information on 191 patients was collected from five years of data. According to the study, about 45 CDH patients are born each year in Korea. Risk factors related with death were AFCA score, oxygenation index, preoperative pH and bicarbonate, uh, oxysaturation, the presence of the hernia sac, and the size of defect. The neonatal survivor and one-year survivor of total patients were 77.6% and 75.3%. The main issue of MIS for CDH is how MIS relates to the recurrence of CDH and how it affects the patient survivor. The incidence of CDH recurrence ranges from 3% to approximately 50%. Previous publications have identified multiple factors associated with uh, recurrence of CDH, including patient variables such as liver herniation, length of study, and treatment variables, including the need for ECMO, operative approach, diaphragmatic patch repair, or abdominal patch requirement. Using MIS as a surgical approach to this disease is already a classification with some selection bias, and the results of several papers do not show that MIS produced poor survival rate. Rather, there are many results of a higher survival rate in group that perform surgery with MIS due to selection bias. Therefore, in this presentation, I will focus more on the relationship with MIS and recurrence and the factors involved in recurrence. Let me introduce some papers and explain the results of my institution. While searching PubMed to present this topic, I looked for four relatively well-organized papers. These are international study or meta-analysis published in 2010, 2014, 2016, and 2017 respectively. I will briefly introduce this content of these papers to you. First, this is a meta-analysis published in Annals of Surgery in 2010. This study was designed for asking whether MIS approaches to neonatal CDH repair are associated with changes in survival, CDH recurrence risk, operative time, 
and or prosthetic patch usage. They included 143 patients from uh, three studies. Uh, there was no statistically significant difference in survival. As you can see in the table A, uh, the risk ratio was 0.33. Uh, in table B, we can see the result of recurrence. Recurrence rates range from 0 to 7.2% 7, 7 in open group and from 5 to 23% in the MIS, MIS group, respectively. This meta-analysis reveals that recurrence was higher in MIS group. Uh, the risk ratio was 3.21. There was no statistically significant difference in prosthetic patch apply between MIS and open repair. And operative time was longer in endosurgical group. This study shows that MIS takes long, a long time, approximately more than 50 minutes. Next study is meta-analysis published in JPS in 2014. There was 4,730 patients in total. 312 was in MIS group, the rest was in open group. This study included 10 studies reporting recurrence rate after MIS and open surgery. Table A is a result of total recurrence associated with MIS. Recurrence rate ranged from 0 to 21.4% in open group and from 0 to 27.6% in MIS, respectively. Three of these studies found no difference between the two procedures, while two found a higher recurrence rate in MIS. In this analysis, they found that recurrence was significantly more likely after MIS than open surgery and the odd ratio was 2.81. They also performed a subgroup analysis for patch repairs only. The result is table B. The authors found that MIS had a significantly higher recurrence rate and the odd ratio was 4.29. Respectively, patchy recurrence rate ranges from 0 to 25% in open group and from 0 to 50% in MIS group. As for the total recurrence in survivors, uh, they obtained the same result as their initial analysis. As you can see in table D, uh, total recurrence in survivors with MIS was significantly more than with open surgery. The odd ratio was 2.45. The result of this study indicate that recurrence of Bogdale hernia is higher following MIS than open surgery when patch repair is performed. Furthermore, operative time is significantly longer than MIS than for open surgery. The third is the International Multicenter Study published in 2016. A multi-center retrospective review was conducted from 2009 to 2015 for thoracoscopic repair only. 109 infants were included. Thoracoscopic surgery was performed for 83 patients. Among them, recurrence was 8.4%. Patch repair was performed for 15 patients in thoracoscopic group. Among 15 patients, only one patient recurred. Conversion to open surgery was performed for uh, 26 patients. These two tables are the analysis of this study. In table 3, the size of the hernia defect, the presence of a hernia sac and whether resected or not, and as well as the hernia contents of liver colon and small bowel or stomach were all found to have no significance in, in hernia recurrence. Table 4 shows the comparison of these variation between infants with and without recurrence who were repaired thoracoscopically. There was only a single recurrence that was repaired with the use of a patch. Despite this finding, there was no significant association identified regarding type of repair, type of patch used, and type of patch repair. In addition, there was also no significant association with type of suture material, extracorporeal suture, and lip fixation sutures. 
The first study is meta-analysis published in JPS. The purpose of this study was to identify patient and treatment characteristics associated with early CTH recurrence. Uh, almost 4,000 patients were entered into the CDH study group registry from 2007 to 2015. The authors found that among patients with CDH, defect size and surgical approach were associated with early diaphragmatic hernia recurrence. Minimal invasive approach is associated with increased early recurrence. No significant association with timing of repair with ECMO support and early recurrence was identified. The following study is a remarkable paper similar to the concept of my recent surgery but also slightly different. I think that probably you already read this paper. The point of the idea is to use a sandwich type mixed patch for both the, uh, the upper and the lower side of the diaphragm muscle. As shown in the picture above, Type A uses a bovine and malex mesh to repair, and Type B in the picture below uses cortex and malex mesh to patch repair. In this paper, the sandwich type of suture procedure is called buttress sutures, and uh, this is described as an important factor in recent recurrent rate reduction. Table 2 shows uh, three significant results. First, neonatal presentation showed significantly higher recurrence than rate pr presentation. And second, hernia sac presence showed significantly lower recurrence than without hernia sac. Third, with very interesting result, buttress group showed a lower rate of recurrence than no buttress group. And there was no recurrence in buttress group. They are explaining that there has been no CDG recurrence for three years since buttress suture started. To reduce the instance of recurrence, the author suggests a sandwich type buttress repair with under A and over A components for both type A and type B defects. So next, I will briefly explain the result of our institution. Our institution seems to perform about uh, 23 CTH operations a year. Survival rates were not good before 2018. It has been rising sharply since 2018 when ECMO protocol was established. We expect to maintain a good survival rate in the future. We started MIS for CDH in 2008. A total of 235 operations were performed from 2008 to 2020, of which MIS account for about 54%. As previous study shown, usually open surgery is performed more than MIS, but the result of our institution has a higher number of MIS than open surgery. This is because we intend to perform MIS for CDH as actively as possible. In the MIS group, we have 20.3% of patients recurred, which is almost similar to the result of other hospitals. MIS has significant association with recurrence and patch repair. In this presentation, I want to analyze the result of our hospital and show you the, show you the result of univariate analysis and multivariate post regression. But I'm currently analyzing the statistics due to uh, the insufficient data organization. I'm sorry, uh, I couldn't show you the result. And I'm going to show you our result at the CAPS conference in June. From now on, I will show you my record cases of CDH. I have performed 38 uh, CDH surgeries so far, 14 open surgeries, and 24 MIS. Among them, uh, there was no recurrence in open surgery, and 5 cases of recurrence in MIS. All of my recurred cases was performed before 2017. The case one was type B patient. I repaired uh, this with, without patch, but as you can see, there was some tension on the suture side. The gap of suture was wider than recent cases, and I remember that there was a slight tearing in the muscle 
caused by the tension, before, before discharge, the hernia was recurred, and I performed open repair for a recall hernia. Case 2 was not the typical recurrence case. The picture on the left was from a first primary repair, and the right one was from surgery for recurred hernia. Unusually, uh, this patient's recurrence was not found in regular, regular X-ray follow-up, but in the abdomen sonography, as pet herniation for other examination. In the view of thoracoscopy, I could not easily find the hernia, so I performed a desolysis. After gentle dissection, I could find uh, the hernia site. When I performed the primary repair, I sutured four number of refixation, but there was not enough to support the tension as a result. At the recurrence hernia repair, I've reduced the gap between the sutures further and performed almost all the sutures in the refixation manner. You can see that in the picture on the right side. After surgery of these two uh, case 1, case 2 recurred case, I reduced the gap of suture and widened the bite of each suture. This case is a recent surgical photo of my thoracoscopic patch repair. The patient was type B. I did the reduction in the order of small bowel, colon, small stomach, and spleen. As usual, I use the spleen as a barrier uh, between abdomen and thorax during suture procedure. I did primary sutures in area where uh, primary sutures are available with minimal tension. At this point, the gap between the sutures is less than 5 mm, and the bite of suture remains greater than 5 mm. In order to reduce tension, I, I do sometimes a slight uh, division between the chest wall and the diaphragm, uh, which can make the primary suture easier. The patch is made 3 mm larger on each side than the size of the pre-measured defect and placed into the thoracic cavity. Sutures are carried out uh, in, the, in, the, in the order as shown in the picture. The suture uh, on the chest wall is to be hung uh, on the ribs as much as possible to secure a strong and stable suture, that is called refixation. Keep the gap between the suture similar to normal intervals. Two methods are possibly used to suture the refixation at the chest wall. There is a way to tie out of the chest wall using the endoclosure, that is the picture on the left side, and the other way is to suture it inside with knot pusher. The stitching sequence is from the top to bottom as shown in the picture. The, the apex of patch, which meets the two sides of the diaphragm, uh, can be the weakest point, suggesting careful structure and slightly overlapping muscle and patches. I almost al always use a pledget in this area. In this way, a uh, patch repair was complete. This is summary. A minimal invasive approach is associated with uh, increased early recurrence and overall recurrence. In thoracoscopic CDH repair, there was no significant association identified regarding type of repair, type of patch used, and type of uh, patch repair. In thoracoscopic CDH repair, neonatal presentation and no presence of hernia sac showed significantly higher recurrence rate. Uh, based on the various studies, uh, we need to think about more advanced way to reduce the recurrence. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your beautiful lecture and sharing uh, technical, important technical details and such tips to uh, managing small babies with abdominal hernia. From now on, we'll, we'd like to about Q&A time for the first ta first presentation with Professor Nam Gung. Uh, 
I would like to Professor Namgung about the result of recurrence after the modification of your uh, patch type as purchasers. Would you give us short talk about that? Uh, recent recent. Um, yeah, yeah. And three years ago, uh, three years ago, I started the three three years of patch, but uh, I didn't use the the purchaser, but. Uh, I did uh, uh, shortening the gap of suture and uh, widening the suture, uh, suture bite. And after that, I don't have the recurrence case yet. And I think it is better than past the surgery. So, uh, so I, but, but I, now I'm uh, consider to use the uh, potential suture after the see the paper of the Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, it is good to use to uh, the re the reduce the recurrence. Thank you uh, for the uh, pointing about the re uh, reducing the recurrence of bacterial hernia. Thank you, Professor Namgung. Thank you very much. And we have uh, time limitation. We should uh, remove, uh, move to next speakers. Uh, I would like to introduce the second speakers. The second speaker is Eunyoung Chang from Daegu Fatima Hospital, and she will give a lecture on the Morgagni hernia. Please stream the uh, second video's presentations. Good morning, I'm Eunyoung Chang from Daegu Fatima Hospital in Korea. Today, I'm going to present Morgagni hernia in pediatric patient focused on minimally invasive surgery. I have no personal or financial interest to declare. Picture taking is allowed during my presentation, including presented slides. Morgagni hernia is a rare congenital diaphragmatic defect. It was first described by Morgagni in 1769. It results from failure of the septum transversum to fuse with the thoracic wall and occurs between the sternal and coastal diaphragmatic attachments in the interior mediastinum. So the defect is found in intermediate space and retrosternal location. Morgani hernia is a type of congenital diaphragmatic hernias. It is rarer than other types of CD8, comprises only 2% to 5% of all CD8. With the pericardial attachments that provide support to the left side of the diaphragm, up to 90% of Morgagni hernia are found on the right side, with only 5% found on the left side and 4% found to be bilateral. Morgagni hernia tends to be less symptomatic so it is diagnosed commonly in childhood or adulthood. However, when discovered in infancy or early childhood, it is associated with other congenital anomalies. With the instance ranging from 34% to 50%. Most common associated anomalies include the cardiac defect, trisomy 21, and malrotation. Morgagni hernia is often discovered incidentally as a mass or air fluid level in chest radiograph. In this case, chest radiograph alone can make the diagnosis approximately 71%. Further imaging by barium enema or chest CT scan can be performed to confirm the diagnosis. 
Pontiac's deck is present in over 90%, most often contains colon or omentum, but can also contain small bowel, stomach, and liver. With the risk of incarceration, up to 10% or the Morgagni hernia should be surgically repaired. Surgical approaches and repair types are still under debate. Thoracic approach can be performed by posterior lateral right thoracotomy. Because of the disadvantages of thoracic incision, such as the risk of missing a bilateral hernia, requiring post-operative ventilator care, and possibility of chest wall deformity, the abdominal approach is more applied. Through an abdominal approach, the location of the defect can be more accurately identified and operators can repair other intra-abdominal pathology at the same time. Abdominal approach can be performed by upper abdominal transverse incision or minimally invasive surgery. Operative procedure is composed of hernia cell resection, mostly defect suture and or patch repair. Minimally invasive surgery for Morgagni hernia in a child was first reported by Joga Kapoor in 1997. Compared to Bogdale hernia, the defect of Morgagni hernia is more easily seen. Advantages of minimally invasive surgery in Morgagni hernia compared to open surgery are shorter recovery time, faster return to normal activities and eating, no difference in complication rate, more space for dissection, and better visualization. Of course, the robotic technique has more improved ergonomics, articulation, and tremor filtration. From now, I will introduce the laparoscopic repair of Morgagni hernia and review my personal case. With the laparoscopic approach, the patient is placed in a reverse Trendelenburg position with the surgeon located at the foot of the bed. Camera port is placed through the umbilicus and two working ports are positioned in the right and left upper abdomen in the midclavicular line. The procedure is as follows. The foxiform ligament may need to be divided for adequate exposure. The hernia contents are reduced. In most cases, hernia sac has to be excised. For defects that do not require a patch or with notation, primary closure is enough. For large defects or with tension, patch repair is performed with or without primary closure. In most cases, there is no anterior rim of the defect. In this case, U-shaped transverse abdominal wall suture, as known as transfacial suture, with extracorporeal knot tying method, can be used. I'm going to give you a picture of the U-shaped transfacial suture with extracorporeal knot tying. In this method, endoscoping suturing device named endoclose passes a braided synthetic non-absorbable suture into the abdomen as shown in figure A. Then, like in figure B, intracorporeal sutures are passed through posterior rim of the diaphragm using laparoscopic needle drivers. Then, needle is retrieved with the endoclose through the same skin incision, shown in figure C. In figure D, 
four sutures are placed, and then in figure E, sutures are tied extracorporeally. This is my case. Six month main weighing 11 kilogram was admitted to pediatric department for aspiration pneumonia. He took on chest x-ray and was instantly diagnosed as Morgagnihonia with the findings of colon invasination into a mediastinum. And on the chest CT scan, herniation of transverse colon in anterior mediastinum was identified. Laparoscopic surgery was performed. When pneumoperitoneum was made, bilateral morgagni hernia with omental herniation was identified. Herniated colon was self-reduced spontaneously. After its season of hernia sac, the defect size was about four centimeter. First, Primary defect closure was done with non-absorbable 3 0 at bond interrupted sutures intracorporeally. Then additional U-shaped transfacial sutures were done by extracorporeal knot tying using endoclose. The picture on right side shows that diaphragm was pulled up more upward after transfacial sutures. This is my operation summary. First step is troca incision, as you can see on the picture. Second, hernia reduction. Third, proximal ligament division. Fourth, hernia sac excision. Fifth, Primary closure of the defect, anterior rim with posterior rim intracorporeally, and the last transfacial suture, U-shape, abdominal wall with posterior rim, extracorporeal knot tying using endoclose. And then I'll give a short video clip, briefly edited, including all the procedures. Bilateral Bulgagni hernia with omental herniation was identified. Herniated colon was separately reduced spontaneously. Momentum was reduced. Proximum ligament was divided. And hernia cell was excised. Primary closure of the diaphragm defect was done intracorporeally.
In some tension sutures, I use the foot pusher. There was no anterior rim. I performed transpecial U-shaped sutures. This is transpecial U-shaped sutures. Endoclose was penetrated the diaphragm through the posterior rim and went back with the suture material. Then subcutaneous note time was made. Three transpecial sutures were applied. After transpecial sutures, diaphragm was more pulled up. Total operation time was two hours, seven minutes. Pyretra Moldavini hernia was successfully repaired by laparoscopically with application of a mixed suture with primary cause of diaphragmatic defect and U-shaped transpecial sutures. After one month and eight months of operation, the patient has no hernia recurrence and no complication. Now, I'd like to suggest some useful tips for laparoscopic Mulgarni hernia repair. First, on the left side, the three millimeter working port is enough to manipulate. But on the right side, five millimeter is needed if you want to use energy device like a harmonic scalpel or ligature. Second, for infants, there is no need for a patch repair, except a large defect. Third, to improve the ergonomics of laparoscopic device, turn the direction of the instrument handle downside up. Lastly, mixed suture is recommended to reinforce the repair. Primary close of anterior rim and posterior rim plus U-shaped transpecial sutures. This figure suggests that the conversion of the direction of the instrument downside up is more ergonomic by decreasing the working angle. Then let's take a look at the prognosis and complications of Mulgarni hernia. Due to the risk of strangulation, bulbarus, and or necrosis, up to 10% of cases, surgical correction is recommended for even asymptomatic patients. The recovery is usually uneventful with most patients being discharged within three or five days of surgery. Complications after surgical correction are low. When the infections, incisional or put-site corneas, stitch abscesses, 
and power of structure can be developed. Recurrence rates have been reported from 2% to 42%. Risk vectors for recurrence are the closure of the defect under tension without the use of a patch, leaving the set in place without resection, use of observable suture of repair, and a patient history of Down syndrome. Follow-up can be performed by check of chest X-ray and chest CT. In conclusion, in pediatric patient with Morgan hernia, minimally invasive surgery as laparoscopy and robotic is successfully visible. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much for your impressive, beautiful <laughs> lectures about the rare cases of Mulgagni hernia. I have just one question about the technical tips to perform MIS in the small babies with Mulgagni hernia. Uh, it, it seems too dif difficult to uh, the upside down technique, as mm -hmm. you shown in your slide, uh, as ergonomic, ergonomic, ergonomic tips. Mm, approach the anterior side of the diaphragm with laparoscopic instrument through abdominal wall. Would you share a, a, a small talk about your experience? Uh, <clears throat> uh, the only difficulty with the harmonic scalpel is that the position of the operating button changes uh, also downside up. So, <clears throat> Uh, someone as a uh, first assistant or camera assistant uh, has to push the operating button. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zhang. And we have a uh, time limitation <laughs> then. So we move to next speakers. Um, please, Professor So, progress next presentation, please. Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this uh, subject is uh, Hayat Hania. It's uh, presented by the uh, Ingol Ho. Uh, Ingol Ho is a uh, professor of the uh, Yonsei University Hospitals, France Hospital. Uh, please start the video. Good morning, I'm Nyong Zhang from the Fatima Hospital in Korea. Today, I'm going to present Morgagni hernia in pediatric patient focused on minimally invasive surgery. I have no personal or financial interest to declare. Picture taking is allowed during my presentation, including presented slides. Morgagni hernia is a rare congenital diaphragmatic defect. It was first described by Morgagni in 1769. It results from failure of the septum transversum to fuse with the thoracic wall and occurs between the sternal and coastal diaphragmatic attachments in the interior mediastinum. So the defect is found in intermediate space and retrosternal location. Morgani hernia is a type of congenital diaphragmatic hernias. It is rarer than other types of CD8 comprises only 2% to 5% of all CD8. With the pericardial attachments that provide support to the left side of the diaphragm, up to 90% of Morgagni hernia are found on the right side, with only 5% found on the left side and 4% found to be bilateral. Morgagni hernia tends to be less 
symptomatic. So it is diagnosed. And then uh, we prepared to the fourth last lecture uh, is started. The last lecture is the the uh, diaphragm eventuation uh, is presented by the uh, Soyeon Nam. He's working in the Dong University uh, Division of the Pediatric Surgery. Uh, he is very interested in the neonatal surgery, laparoscopic surgery, job out and intestinal failure. Uh, please start to the uh, video. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my God. Thank you for giving me a great opportunity to present this topic here in KSERS. My name is So Hyun Nam, and I'm a pediatric surgeon at Dong University. I have no personal or financial interest to declare. Today, I will talk about diaphragm eventuation in children. Eventuation of the diaphragm is an uncommon disorder, characterized by an elevation of the hemidiaphragm without defects of continuity. All or part of the diaphragmatic muscle is replaced by fibroelastic tissue. Reading to a fiend, apply over center portion of the diaphragm. It can occur due to a congenital migration defect of myoblasty during embryogenesis. Diaphragmatic muscle could not fully develop. In the United States, it was reported that two-thirds of the cases were congenital eventuation, and right-side eventuation is more common than left-side. Acquired diaphragmatic eventuation is caused by injury of a fretting nerve. It causes from birth trauma and various types of cardiac surgery and thoracic surgery. Diaphragmatic paralysis after cardiac surgery is one of important complications, with incidence ranging from 0.4% to 0.9%. In my personal experience, enlarged mediastinal tumor involved the planning of it leads loss of contractility of diaphragm and progressive atrophy of the diaphragm. The weakened hemidiaphragm shows paradoxical movement. It is displaced into thorax. It compromises breathing due to lung compression by abdominal content. Diaphragm eventuation leads decrease the lung volume and tidal volume, increase the workload of breathing. Children or infants experience severe respiratory distress, or they are difficult to wean from the ventilator support. Clinical symptoms are varying from patient, from asymptomatic to those with severe respiratory distress. The most common manifestations involve the respiratory tract and GI tract. Patients can show tachymnia, respiratory distress, use of accessory muscle of respiration, and cyanosis. Typically, neonates present more severe symptoms. The decisions regarding the need for surgical intervention is based on the severity of clinical findings and their effects on the ability of the infant to feed and to gain weight. The chest X-ray shows typical findings. The hemiodiaphragm appears elevated on a frontal or lateral view on chest radiography. The left and right distances between the peaks of the hemiodiaphragm and apex were measured like this picture. 
The eventuation level was calculated as a percentage by using the B per A ratio. Using this calculation, we can compare pre-operative status and post-operative outcome. The latter view demonstrated that the anterior and posterior diaphragmatic attachment are in the correct positions. If there is uncertainty of the diagnosis, ultrasound can be helpful to confirm the diagnosis. In case of diaphragmatic eventuation, diaphragm movement is minimal or paradoxical during breathing. Shown rising with inspiration and falling with expiration. The primary differential diagnosis is congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Especially in the case of CDH, which have a hernia cell, it is very difficult to distinguish from diaphragmatic eventuation. Pulmonary sequestration and congenital pulmonary airway malformations may be considered as well. However, these entities are more likely to appear as lung mass. Medical treatment focused on respiratory support. It is based on the infant respiratory status. Adequate nutrition is imperative to meet the metabolic needs of the infant. The level of respiratory support dictates how nutrition is provided. Surgical treatment is indicated only for symptomatic patient. In some cases, especially those with partial defect, initial medical management may be sufficient with the resolution of the symptoms. However, symptomatic patient who shows persistent respiratory symptoms, difficult in weaning from ventilator, recurrent chest infection, or poor growth due to inadequate intake, need to surgical correction. Multiple superimposed walls of plicated sutures designed to take up the slag in the diaphragm and fix it to a lower position. Through this procedure, we can provide a space for lung expansion. It returns abdominal contents back to normal position. It can result in a flattened dome of the diaphragm, which increases resting lung volume and improves action of the intercostal and abdominal muscles during breathing. The main planning nerve on each side divides into anterior and posterior division. A sternal branch immediately of the anterior division and a bifurcation of the posterior division. The branch is long in a medial to lateral orientation. Aligned sutures should be placed to minimize the risk of injury to the muscular branches of the planning nerve. The points A and A' prime represent the portions of the diaphragm that will be brought together by the plication. Open thoracotomy has been the traditional approach for surgical plication. Video-assisted thoracic surgery may offer a less invasive method because it avoids the incision of the lower intercostal muscles, which may adversely affect ventilation. These days, thoracoscopic application became more prevalent than laparoscopic application because it provides ample working space and gives direct visualization of the planning nerve. There is no consensus regarding which minimally invasive procedure is preferred for this repair. The choice is dependent on surgeons, the expertise, and experience. This paper showed that laparoscopic group showed a higher recurrence than thoracoscopic group. They explained that it might be related 
differences in etiology of diaphragm eventuation. Laparoscopic group included more planning of precipitation, and thoracoscopic group included more congenital lesion. Also, laparoscopic approach showed limited view of the diaphragm because of obstruction by the liver, stomach, or intestines. In this paper, we can find that interoperative and tidal CO2 was lower in thoracoscopic group than laparoscopic group. Also, it didn't show significant differences between two groups for operative hemodynamic recovery, including timing of extubation and cessation of oxygen supplementation. This is a picture of congenital diaphragm eventuation. What do you prefer for publication? I will introduce several techniques based on recent papers. Traditional method is pleating suture technique, and another option is invasinating technique. Most recent report introduced double persistent suture technique. We know two options of application, pleating and invasinating suture. The pleating technique is making several interrupted sutures on multiple folds in the center of the diaphragmatic eventuation, resulting in an accordion-like shape. Invasinating technique is suturing between the eventuating edges to cover and press the eventuated diaphragm. Traditionally, we did pleating sutures. Plication is oriented from anteromedial to posterior lateral way. As you can see here, we found thinned and plicable diaphragm in central portion. Like accordion, we sutured both ends of healthy diaphragm with thin diaphragm muscle in one suture. Finally, we did multiple superimposed loads of applicated sutures. This technique is folding both sides of the weakened diaphragm to the middle and performed interrupted sutures with non-absorbable material. This technique is introduced by Dr. Demos. This method is applicable for others using BAT. The first suture line running toward the anterior cardioprenic recess away from the surgeon, and then suture returning back through the working incision. The returning suture line overshoots the original suture line, implicating additional tissue beyond that captured in the first suture line. Dr. Gin compared the pleating technique and invasinating technique. Pleating technique showed low recurrence weight because most of the diaphragm is fixed with thread. However, during minimal invasive surgery, especially in infant, multiple repeated suture is more difficult to implement than invasinating. They showed comparable data between two groups. Also, operative time was shorter in invasinating group. The long-term outcome was not inferior to pleating technique. Dr. Parkla introduced new method called double pulse string suture. 
They plant the first pastures in the tree with the hook cut tree. Then, apply the first pastures tree to the tree with the continuous numb absorbable sutures. Pastures tree suture is gathering using the knot pusher, and then the same procedure is repeated, approximately two cm apart, as the second layer. The outcome of patients who underwent surgical application is generally excellent. This was best illustrated in a large Chinese case series of 177 patients with congenital eventuation that reported the follow of 86 patients who underwent surgical application at a mean age of 2.4 years. Post-operative complications were reported in 13 patients. One month after application, symptoms were reported in only 7 patients, including tachymnia, vomiting, and recurrent respiratory infections. At one year follow-up, there were no reported symptoms in any patient. Other smaller case series have reported satisfactory diaphragmatic motion and pulmonary functional studies following surgical application. To summarize this topic, diaphragm eventuation is elevation of the diaphragm without defect of continuity. Weakened diaphragm with a paradoxical movement affect respiratory function. Time surgical treatment should be considered for a symptomatic patient. Surgical option for diaphragm application depends on surgeon's expertise and experience. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you for your excellent uh, presentation. Uh, is, uh, uh, we are very sorry for the technical error. And uh, this online is the uh, time is very important is uh, uh, sorry. Uh, I think uh, there's so many questions and the debate. However, we have no time. Please uh, send your questions in the chat rooms, and we will uh, send to the reply immediately. Please. Uh, we move to the uh, Professor Nam so thank you for your presentation. And uh, we move to the next uh, subject because of the time limitation. I'm sorry. Next is uh, uh, Hayata Hodia, is uh, presented by the uh, Ingol Ho. Uh, he's a professor of the Yonsei University Disabled Hospitals. Please uh, start the next uh, lecture. Uh, start the next, next uh, presentation. Start. Yeah. I'm so sorry. It's a one minute later. It's the next. Uh, uh, Presentation is started, will be started. Okay. Uh, Professor uh, Nam, Professor Nam? Hi. Yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, what is your preferred to the application and the invagination? Uh, actually, I have no experience about invaginating suture. So, con conventionally, <laughs> I did plating suture. Uh, during this pre presentation preparation, I think about the uh, double string suture. Uh, it looks very easy. <laughs> yeah. Here's the plating suture. I recommend it to the Vuila. Do you know the Vuila? Uh, yes. Vuila. Yes. I now times is usually using the Vuila. Very convenient. Okay. Recommend it to the Vuila. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, please next uh, lecture. Okay. Professor Nam, uh, would you uh, 
recommendation or on other things? Would you like to, to speak? <laughs> no. <laughs> no? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I have a very difficulty to the estimate of the, uh, the, the, the indication of the patient. Uh, the patient have no symptom. However, is uh, about uh, one first or one, one third is uh, uh, pre uh, uh, eventuation. At the time, is, uh, uh, is a follow up six or one year later is no changing. Uh, what is uh, your opinion, this patient here? <sighs> We move to the next lecture, uh, please uh, start the next lecture. Yeah. Please start next lecture. Ladies and gentlemen and chairman, nice to meet you. My name is Inger Ho for Sebrans Hospital Seoul, Korea. My major is a pediatric surgeon. Today, I'd like to talk about hiatal hernia in pediatric patients. I have no personal or financial support. You can take a picture. The hiatal and paraesophageal hernia is a rare condition that can be occurred from congenital or acquired. The congenital hiatal hernia can be resulting from embryology of normalist, genetic predisposition, and acquired most commonly after gastroesophageal surgery. The diagnosis most frequently in neonate preload in a small group of children can be diagnosis beyond the newborn age during the late infancy to early childhood. Treatment is surgical with the goal of reducing the hernia content, exceeding the hernia sac, close the crura and performing an anti-reflux procedure. The laparoscopy approach is safe and effective. The following figure describes the type of heart hernia. Type 1 or sliding hernia occur when the gastroesophageal junction abnormally proteocephalo into the chest through the esophagus hiatus. A type 2 paraesophageal hernia occurs when the gastric fundus herniates through the esophageal hiatus. Along with the lower thoracic esophagus EG junction, remain in the appropriate intra-abdominal location. Type 3 represents a combination of type 1 and 2 with the intra-thoracic position of G junction and herniation of the gastric fundus. Type 4 involves herniation of other intra-abdominal content, in addition to the stomach, such as colon, small intestinal, spleen, or omentum. The true incidence of congenital heart hernia is unknown, but this diagnosis is flat to be uncommon. In the Montreal series of 40 patients of congenital Paraesophageal hernia type 3 was the most common. There have only been a few case reports of type 4 in the pa pediatric population. Any surgical dissection at the esophageal hiatus resulting in the disruption of phrenal esophageal membrane can to development of hiatal hernia. The most common pediatric procedure during from the application for gastroesophageal reflux and the risk of acquired heart hernia has been shown to be related to the extent of periesophageal dissection. A prospective randomized control trial during nascent from the application comparing circumferential esophageal mobilization to minimal dissection leaving the Phreno esophageal membrane intact found a post operative herniation rate at one year minimal follow up of 22.8% for the circumferential dissection compared to 2.8% for the minimal dissection group. 
If adequate length of intra-abdominal espouse is present, then the little dissection as possible is performed to help prevent migration of the fundal application web through the enlarged esophageal hiatus. The phrenal esophageal ligament is keeping in depth in both patients. Patients with either congenital or acquired heart hernia can be asymptomatic or more commonly present with a variant of gastrointestinal, respiratory, and constitutional symptom. Symptomatic gastroesophageal reflux was present in 50%. Other common present symptoms are show recurrent respiratory infection, anemia, and failure to thrive. Physical exam is often unrevealing but may be here by sound on occlusion of the chest. Evaluation often begins with anterior posterior and lateral chest x-ray. The cyst makes in the posterior mediastinum with the airflow level. However, chest x-ray can appear normal in the case of heart hernia owing to the possibility to intermittent reduction. The difference diagnosis of fluid field posterior mediastinal systems would include pulmonary abscess, congenital pulmonary airway malformation, pneumatocele, mediastinal tumor, forgot duplication cyst, esophageal perforation. Apogea can confirm the diagnosis by demonstrating a contrast field stomach herniate cephalo into the posterior mediastinum. Apogee can also demonstrate bulbulous microgastria, esophageal dilatation, and gastroesophageal reflux, but has also been reported as normal in the presence of heart hernia and paraesophageal hernia. CT, which has the advantage of demonstrating the size and the content, as well as excluding other pulmonary or mediastinal etiologies. In general, the surgical approach should include reduction of hernia content, excision of hernia sac, crura close, and performing anti-reflux procedure. Due to loss of normal anatomy at the G junction, the anti-reflux procedure serves to treat the high rate of co-exciting gastroesophageal reflux. South Africa series no anti-reflux procedure was performed, and 16% developed significant gastroesophageal reflux. The minimal invasive surgery in infant and children, even complex forgot procedure, are being performed by surgeon for rare condition. There have been reports on the efficacy and safety of laparoscopy surgery for heart hernia. In 10 year review of more than 1,000 fund application, Rosenberg had a 0.2% conversion to open rate, a 1.1 day average length of stay, and a 4% fund application failure rate. Specifically to heart hernia, Yagi published a 2003 series managed laparoscopy with no recurrence at a mean follow up of 30 months, and Betoli published a 2008 three of four patients with large paraesophageal hernia approached laparoscopically with one patient recording conversion to open. More recent, 2040 study from Korea with retrospectively revelation the outcome of laparoscopy versus open hernia, heart hernia repair. In this study, there were two 25 type 1 heart hernia and paraesophageal heart hernia. The laparoscopy procedure took long operation time but had a short 
time to oral intake. This figure shows patient and troca position. Infant and small children are placed at the foot of operating table in the frog leg position. Old child are placed in raw risotomy. The surgeon stands at the foot of the operating table or between the patient leg with the assistant to the patient left and the scrub step to the patient right. A 5 mm troca is introduced through the umbilicus for a 30 degree laparoscopy. Three additional troca insert. One in the right middle abdomen for placement of liver retract. Two surgeon working port in the upper abdomen. The gastrohepatic ligament is divided with attention to the present of accessory left hepatic artery. The right cruise identified and the degree of hiatal hernia and contents are evaluated. The hernia contents are reduced back into the abdomen. The hernia cell is grasped and dissected free from the mediastinum and crura attachment being carefully not to violate the pleura. The hernia cell is seasoned to ensure adequate identified of the crura. The interrupted 30 atibone suture are placed posterior to the esophagus to clo close the crura. The crura are further secured to the esophagus with interrupted 30 atibone suture at the 1, 4, 8, and 11 acra position. The two fold are sutured together with three thick suture to create a two centimeter fund application. The type of fund application is surgeon dependent, and the surgeon should perform whichever fund application they are most proficient with. From now, I will talk about personal experience. This patient is a five year old female. She was born an IUP 13-7 week with 2 kg, and she had no other medical history. One day, she was busy local pediatric hospital for URI symptom and take chest x-ray exam. In chest x-ray was found CT max and then referred to our hospital. Initial ex chest x-ray shown CT max in mediastinum with air fluid level and pre-operation spagography shown type 3 hiatal hernia The operation by laparoscopy. First, use the snake retractor to elevate left liver and expose the hiatus. And they use grasper gently reduction hernia contents. From intrathoracic to intraabdomen. Also use the energy device to remove hernia cell after reduction hernia content. Use the etibond studio suture to repair crura and fixation spouse to anterior cruise by motif suture.
Kleiner performed the anti-reflex procedure, usually by Nissen from the application. Six months after surgery, no recurrence on other abnormality were observed on the follow-up X-ray and the esophagraphy. Next is a nine months male patient. He has no other medical history and he visited local pediatric hospital for recurrent vomit from one month ago. Initial chest x-ray that was shown rheumatic organ in the chest. The barium enema show colon herniation to intrathoracic via hiatus. In operation, there was a show multiple intra-abdominal organ herniation to intrathoracic cavity. I use the grasp to gently reduction hernia organ. It was very difficult to reduction. and then use the energy device to ligate short gastric artery mobilize the fundus and was used non observable suture to repair crura and as false fixation in Christmas. Finally, perform the Nissen fund application. In follow X ray and esophagraphy, there was no recurrence. Last case is acquired heart hernia. This patient was a seven years old male patient. He has neurology impairment and performed Nissen from the application and gastrostomy from treatment GRD in three years ago. In follow-up, patient showed recurrent GRD symptom. The esophagraphy via gastrostomy Due to patient cannot swallowing, die from mouth, and the hiatal hernia was confirmed.
This patient was performed surgery by laparoscopy too. That was shown severe adhesion due to previous surgery. The gently adhesionalysis with reduction of hernia contents. Repair hiatus use no, so, no observable suture and the web was intact in this case, so we do not redo from the application again. Follow x-ray and espirography, there was no recurrence and symptom improved. How sent injury to the stomach or espouse during the repair, feeding is initiated with 24 hours after operation with build up for feed with 48 hours. Regarding hospital length of stay, Rosenberg series of more than 1,000 laparoscopic fund application has a mean length of stay of 1.1 day. He has been our experience that most patients may be discharged on post-operative day 3 or 4. Also, neurologically impairment patients may require a longer length of stay. Various post-operative complications have been reported after heart hernia repair, including dysphagia, recurrent heart hernia, pneumonia, pneumothorax, valve obstruction, intersubsection, bleeding, wound infection and gastroparalysis. Patients with dysphagia should be treated conservatively with liquid diet for at least four to six weeks before considered dilation of hiatus on the application. The mortality rate after hiatahernia approached zero. Recurrence of hiatahernia is perhaps the outcome of most interest. For primary repair for congenital heart hernia study, the recurrence rate ranges from 0 to 11%. As noted previously, one study report recurrence of gastroesophageal reflux, which was up to 16% recurrence for reflux symptom in patients who did not have a fund application at the time of initial operation. In one study of acquired heart hernia over a six-year period, 217 patients under laparoscopy and application and 12% present with MHCs and were diagnosed with iatrogen heart hernia with thoracic herniation of web via apogee and required, required reoperation. Mesh replacement at the time of reoperation for first or second recurrence of heart hernia with transuratic migration of fund application appears to be beneficial in reducing the incidence of re herniation. However, the use of proplatic mesh at the time of initial surgery has not been studied in pediatric population. This may be area of interest for further study to decrease the rate of required postoperative heart hernia. Thank you for your excellent lectures. Uh, we are very sorry for the technical error and time limitation. Please send your question and comment to the room.
we uh, send it to the reply immediately. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the speaker and audience. Uh, finishing, yeah. The next session will be continuously started.